favor with Boaz, such favor that he commanded his servants to pull out grain from the bundles for her to make it easy for her to glean. He told her to stay close to his servants until the end of the harvest, and she did so, gleaning until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. But now the harvest has ended. What will Ruth do? Let's find out. I'm in Ruth chapter 3, verse 1, reading from the New American Standard Version. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you? that it may be well with you? Now, is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. So interesting that in chapter one, when Naomi told Ruth and Orpah to return to Moab, her main concern was that they find a husband. She said she was too old to bear sons who could fill that role. But Naomi clearly didn't imagine that God could work through other means, right in Israel. She didn't imagine that Ruth would go out to glean and in God's sovereignty, find herself in the field of Boaz, a close and wealthy relative. And not only that, but that Ruth would find such favor with Boaz. Now the wheels are turning in Naomi's mind. She loves her daughter-in-law and wants security for her. So she says, is not Boaz our kinsman? God is the one who brought about this connection between Ruth and Boaz. He's the one who led her to Boaz. He's the one who gave her favor with Boaz. Naomi realized that the Lord had not forgotten about her. So now that hope has dawned once again, she's got a plan. She says, behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Once the harvest has ended, the produce is spread over the threshing floor, a flat surface, and cattle or oxen would crush the sheaves with their hooves to break them apart. The grain would be separated out and tossed into the air so that the wind would blow away the chaff. That's the winnowing part. It's a whole process, and Naomi knows that Boaz will be there himself. Continuing verse 3, Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be, when he lies down, that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, all that you say, I will do. I have heard so much through the years about Naomi's strategy and what takes place thereafter. To some, Naomi was a schemer in the worst way and set up a compromising position between Ruth and Boaz. To others, Naomi had the best of intentions and lots of opinions in between. I said in chapter one that Naomi had allowed her bitterness to cloud her judgment and she wasn't clinging to God, which showed in the counsel she gave Ruth and Orpah to return to their people and their gods. But I believe Naomi is in a different place now. She was blown away when Ruth returned with all of that barley and she said, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and the dead. Naomi saw God's hand at work and she continued to see that as Ruth gleaned until the end of the harvest. God was providing for them through Boaz. Naomi knew Boaz's character. She saw the way he protected and cared for her. I don't think Naomi was thinking, girl, we're going to get you this man no matter how we have to go about it. I don't think when Naomi said, you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down, that she meant for Ruth to sleep with him. It's been said that this was actually an ancient Near Eastern custom. Through this, Ruth would be proposing marriage. Now, granted, given what we know about the flesh, no good thing dwells in the flesh. It's not the wisest move to lie down with a man who may have even been drinking wine in the middle of the night. Do not try this at home. 
But when Naomi said, he will tell you what you shall do, she believed Boaz would have the noblest of intentions and act accordingly. She was taking into account both Boaz and Ruth's character. Ruth doesn't balk at the plan and why would she? This man has been overly gracious and kind to her. She says, I'll do it. Continuing verse six. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. So Ruth is fully on board with this thing. She adds her own language. Spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Deuteronomy 5, 5 and 6 says this. When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. So according to Hebrew custom, if possible, the family name and inheritance would stay within the family. Ruth is aware of this. Naomi certainly is. But what does this mean? Spread your covering over your maid. Similar language is used in Ezekiel 16, 8, where God is speaking of Israel and says, then I passed by you and saw you and behold, you were at the time for love. So I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord God. So this language was understood as speaking to covenant and protection. Ruth was clearly speaking of marriage and that's how Boaz understood it. Continuing verse 10, then he said, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Now it is true, I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Remain this night and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives lie down until morning. So this is partly why some see Naomi as a schemer because they say she surely knew that there was a closer relative. Yet she came up with this strategy to get Ruth with Boaz. But this was where God was working. God was the one who led Ruth to Boaz's field. God was the one who gave her such high favor with Boaz. Naomi was moving in what God had already set in motion. Boaz is understood as being much older than Ruth. We see that in his calling her my daughter, as well as this statement that it's a kindness that she would extend this proposal to him and not a younger man. Boaz knows this took courage for her to come down to the threshing floor and make this proposal. He says, do not fear. And imagine how she must feel when he says, I will do whatever you ask. Whatever you ask, Ruth. Why? Because he says, all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Again, much favor. She came to Bethlehem as a foreigner. Now she is known in the city and she's known for her excellence. Her heart has to be soaring. Boaz thinks highly of her 
and says he'll do whatever she asks. But there is this snag, the relative who's closer. Boaz is a man of integrity. He wants to first see if this closer relative will redeem Ruth. Let's talk about this word redeem. To redeem meant to regain possession of by payment or to buy back something that was lost. The word for kinsman redeemer meant one who delivers or rescues. God used the word redeem many times in relation to Israel, as in Deuteronomy 7, 8. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Boaz promises Ruth, if the closer relative does not wish to redeem you, I will, as the Lord lives. Continuing verse 14, so she lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again, he said, give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. So she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. This man does not cease to protect and provide for this woman. He knows she has a reputation for excellence and does not want to see it tainted in any way. He knows nothing happened between them. It was morally upright, but people would talk if they knew she'd been there. So Boaz says, don't even let it be known that she came here. And he gives her food to take with her. Ruth is probably praying, I don't know who this closer relative is, Lord, but whoever he is, let him have no interest in me. Continuing verse 16, when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. She said, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty handed. Then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Naomi probably could not sleep that night, wondering what was happening and what Boaz said and did. When Ruth walked in with more barley, I'm sure she knew that was a sign that it went well. Naomi gets the report and she knows Boaz is going to settle this today. She tells Ruth to wait, and this is probably the longest day in Ruth's life. This is what it looks like to cling to God. We don't see Boaz talking to God or worshiping God, but we see the worship and the relationship through his actions. A woman lies down with him in the middle of the night, and he not only protects her virtue, he makes sure others do as well. He speaks a blessing over her, showers her with kindness, and shares from the abundance with which he's been blessed. If you are clinging to God, it's going to show. It can't help but show toward others. I said in chapter two that as we read about Boaz, our thoughts should primarily go toward the Lord and the relationship that we can have with him. Boaz is a reflection of Christ who is infinitely more to us. But I want to add, if you are a single woman, let the heart of Boaz be an example and a standard for you. You want a man who not only says he's Christian, who not only attends church on Sunday, but one who walks in godliness, one who is morally upright. You want a man who protects you in every way who's not looking out for himself and what he can selfishly gain, who's not trying to get you in bed using lame words like God knows our hearts. You want a man who is for real clinging to God and you want to be the woman who is for real clinging to God. We read Ruth and Boaz and we're awed by it because of the godliness we see on every level. In Christ, we have the spirit of God and the ability to walk by the spirit, to walk like this in godliness. 
You can be the awe-inspiring story of what God is able to do when you cling to him. But again, I don't want to leave the focus on earthly relationships. We have a God who has redeemed us. We were slaves of the enemy. What was the purchase price of our redemption? The blood of Jesus on the cross. Ephesians 1 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. We were set free, delivered from darkness to light. We will praise the Lord forever for his mighty power in rescuing us and for his love in even wanting to redeem us. Take the time to praise him right now. Cling to him, your Redeemer.